welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. God's good. Come on, stand on your feet. Let me go to my knees and let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the miracle of being able to stand back up at my age. Oh, glory to God. And we thank you, Father, for this as we approach the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. We're just so in love with you, Lord. We come into the house of God and many people that are in here, not only do they need a touch from you, they need to be talked to, they need your heart to encourage them, they need you to encourage their heart. And Lord, we just ask that you would just bless us with the word of God tonight. Let it become alive and real on the inside of us. Show us your way, your will, your want for us. Because you know how to do life when we don't know how to do life. We do life and we get it all messed up. But when we follow you, then we find ourselves doing life right and we get blessed just the way it is. So Father, let your word become alive to us. And Holy Spirit, you're the teacher of the church, not a man, not a woman, not an old man, young man, not a tall man or short man, not a black man, white man, not a girl, nothing else, God, just you. And we'll give you the praise and give you the whole glory, Holy Spirit. So come and touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, and bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this day and tonight and tomorrow and whenever. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Everybody's in agreement. With a great big shout, we say amen. I have this little message on my heart since Sunday night because Sunday night, Deborah ministered fabulously, I don't know if you were here or not, in a, a just amazing message on women and marriage, and it was just a magnificent understanding of Scripture. Just quite frankly, last Sunday night, it just doesn't get any better than what we heard. If you didn't, and if you should, if you didn't hear it, you should get the CD on that and, and uh, listen to it, because it's pretty amazing. She made a statement about um, the power of force and the power of meekness. I don't know if you were here. I'll explain it to you in just a moment. But um, the title of tonight's message is Displaying the Goodness of God. You and I are God's hands and you and I are God's shoulders and arms. You and I are God's mouth and you and I are God's legs on this planet. You and I carry the message of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. and Man, we are really blessed by God when we understand that and start to do it. Then God opens up great, amazing doors. But one of the things that God loves to see his church do is display something that's oftentimes difficult to do. That's the very goodness of God. The very goodness of God is contrary to to the ways the world calls good. You know, the world calls this good or that good. And none good, the Bible makes it very clear, Jesus says none good but God. Goodness is defined by what God says is good, not what society or social systems or the Supreme Court says is good, but what literally God says is good. It's a completely different thinking system. We operate in a completely different realm. We are operating in a different kingdom. We live here on earth, but we're not of this earth. We're of the heavens. We're in a new kingdom. We've been translated out of the old kingdom of darkness by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and brought into a new kingdom. And because we're now in this new kingdom, our thinking, our lifestyle, and everything changes. I mean, how we do life should change. If you don't know how to do that, then you have to go somewhere to find out. And this is the manual on how to get your life to where God wants it to be. So you can be successful in every area of your life so that you can be blessed by God. And God wants you and I to carry the goodness to a lost and dying world. The goodness of God. And I find it at times difficult to do because... What I think is different than what God thinks and what I feel oftentimes is different than what, what God says for me to feel. 
And I have to be honest with you, what I'm going to share with you tonight is not something that I have done in, for years and find myself easy doing. It's not easy at all. It's very difficult. And it's that struggle between the force of this world, the power force, the power of force, like for an example, and the power of meekness. I'm, I'm more of a power of force type person. In other words, you press on me and I'm going to press back on you. You push on me and I'll push harder back on you. And my force hopefully is stronger than your force and therefore I win. And that's what we know. But there's a different force in the kingdom of God and that's the one we need to adapt to. It is called the force of meekness. And Deborah was explaining that kingdom principle which is very hard for some of us, especially men, to to adapt to. That's, a, that's a, a different kind of a force. That's, the word meekness is a word that means really flexible to the things of God instead of acting on the nature that you live in. It's a natural thing for us to have a force, a power behind us. You push me, I push you with more force. You trouble me, I trouble you. You come against me, I come harder against you. And this natural force has got to be ceased inside of the body of Christ and we've got to pick up a new force called meekness which is really the love of God expressed when, when something else is coming against us when there's a, something that's putting force against us something that's an enemy to us instead of coming back and putting force on it we, we come back and we operate in a different realm the love of God that's why Jesus makes the statement that you, man hits you on one side of your cheek, turn your cheek. I've hated that scripture all my life. It just does not fit with my personality. I mean, I'm a guy when Deborah's on the road, I'm a guy that watches boxing in the weather station. I, you can come home and that's it. It'll be boxing in the weather station. I don't know why it's boxing in the weather station. I have no idea, but what is it with men that love the weather station? And so I understand a certain kind of force in order to get something done. And this other kind of force, this force that is, that is a God kind of force is, is, is described in Scripture as meekness. The flexibility to the ways of God. The giving up of the physical force and adapting in the new kingdom a different principle. By the way, the Bible makes it very clear that love never fails. So it's a greater force. It's the supreme power of the universe is the love of God. I find it incredibly difficult, but I find it all through the scriptures, Old Testament as well as New Testament. It obviously is a characteristic of God. For an example, Jesus spoke of it in Luke the 6th chapter, if you've got your Bibles. In Luke the 6th chapter, verse number 27, he makes this statement, but I say unto you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those that hate you. My goodness, wait a minute. That doesn't even calculate. You know what I'm, does any men in here know what I'm talking about? That doesn't even make sense. And yet, here God makes this statement that we're to <clears throat> do something with these enemies, those people that oppose us, those people that come against us, people that are contrary to what we think in our lifestyle. And he says, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you. I mean, I love the scriptures, I love the Bible, but oftentimes things will be said in scripture that are so against my natural man that it's hard for me to adapt to. And I adapt to it to the very best I can because I know that God would not ask me to do something like that if it was crazy, number one. And number two, he wouldn't ask me to do it if I couldn't do it. He's not just laughing in heaven and saying, well, you know, I've asked you to do something. Ha, 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 you little stupid fool on the earth. You can't do it, but you'll keep trying and it won't work. Let me tell you something. With the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of me, I can do that. I didn't say I want to do it. Sometimes when God speaks about things, you know, we got to get past our wants in order to do it. I like what he says in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number 24. It says, therefore, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If, you're, if they're thirsty, he says, give them a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire 
on his head. You ever thought about that, what the heck that means? I like heaping the coals of fire on my enemy, but I'm not quite sure what in the heck that means. I don't think it means what I feel. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, if he's an enemy, heaping coals of fire on him, hey, now we're talking. But that's not what he's talking about. What he's really saying here is that you will put a great weight against their conscious thinking about you. And it brings around a change. In other words, it wasn't the resistance that we experience of, if you will, of force. It was a resistance that we're experiencing that comes from meekness because we're a person that deals in the love of God. Feed them. And he says, if they're thirsty, give them drink. In doing so, you'll heap coals of fire. You'll change their thinking about you by what you do with them. Isn't that amazing? It's like crazy. All through the scripture, Old Testament as well as New Testament. There's this guy, one of my favorite people in the Bible, it's a guy named Joseph. Comes from a bunch of brothers, you know, that are really rough, rugged guys. And uh, in fact, his father, Jacob, who's Israel, had sons, and these sons become the tribes of Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed, Israel, and his sons become the tribes of Israel. Well, Joseph was loved greatly by his father. He was like the father really, really cared about young Joseph. Joseph was one of the youngest of all the sons. And the father really extremely favored Joseph. Joseph has this dream from God. And the dream is that someday your mother and your father will bow down before you. You'll be so great. And Joseph, you'll be so great that even your brothers will bow down. These older, rough, rugged brothers, you know, they're going to bow down before you. And Joseph, being a young, dumb kid, goes to his brothers who hate him anyway. And they, he says, listen, someday I got this dream that I'm going to be great and you're going to bow down to me. And man, they just go off. It's like, this is, that's it. I can't stand this kid anyway. Dad loves him more than me and I, I hate this and I'm totally jealous. And they're not saying that, but that's what they're feeling. They grab this boy when he's out in the wilderness. They beat him up and throw him down a well. He doesn't die down there, so they drag him out of the well and they sell him to a caravan that's coming by on the way to Egypt as a slave. So all of a sudden, Joseph, who's beaten up, probably half dead, is sold as a slave going to Egypt, leaving his family completely behind. They go tell the dad that a wild animal ate Joseph while they were out there. They put blood all over his coat, showed the dad. The dad just cries and weeps. is sick about his son being eaten by an animal. And dad, it's just, just horrible. So the dad finally gets over it, I guess. And the kids, the br brothers get over it. And Joseph goes to Egypt, as you all know the story. And there in Egypt, he's thrown in a prison. I mean, things can't get better. Wait a minute, God. I thought people were going to bow down to me. He's thrown into a prison year after year after year. He's in prison. Can you imagine at all what a prison must have been like in Egypt thousands of years ago? There wasn't any plumbing. There wasn't any toilets. There wasn't any air conditioning. There wasn't any but rats and, and stinking animals and, and urine and, and feces all over the place. Plus the people were in there for long periods of time, were starved and crazy as can be and you had to sleep around them. And I mean, there was no, if you died, they dragged your body out and threw it to the wild animals. They didn't care if you lived or died. And he's in this prison for years. And finally something happens that he does something and God gets him out of prison. Now he's a young man. And he gets out of prison and one day, he, one day he goes from prison to the palace as the number two prime minister of all of Egypt. Only one person had more authority than him and that was Pharaoh himself. What a story. There's a famine in the land. You don't even know what the word famine means. Famine means there's starvation. There's lack of water, lack of food. Famine means there's nothing. It's everything's dying in the land. 
But he used wisdom and stored up for this famine because he knew it was coming. And he became a powerful man in Egypt. And then finally everybody was starving coming to Egypt and he would sell the goods to, and, the, and the Pharaoh just got richer and richer and richer and he was exalted more and more and more. And one day, here come his brothers looking for food. And they don't recognize him. He's grown up. He's a man now. He's the number two man in all of Egypt. What everybody says he does, what he says everybody does, he is powerful. He is wealthy. He's got it all together. It certainly didn't even recognize him at all. But he recognized his brothers. Now me? <laughs> Those brothers are... Blessed that I wasn't Joseph. I'd have tortured those suckers. And you would have too, and you know it. But he's different. At first, he doesn't know how to deal with it. Finally, after numerous experiences with him, the Bible makes a statement. Instead of him coming against his enemies, the brother, who literally ruined his life, beat him up, threw him into prison, sold him off as slavery. Every hope, every vision, years went by, lost his family, lost everything. These guys ruined everything. Yes, God redeemed it, but how many years of torture did he go through before it was redeemed? How much pressure did he have? How many nights of heartache and fear did he have? What did he have going? I mean, this young man could have easily held a grudge, could have easily, more than anybody in here, been mad and ugly and angry, wanting to torture those brothers for what they had done. And he makes this statement. I want to share it with you because it's all about carrying the goodness, all about displaying the goodness of God. And can I say this to you? Listen to me now. If you want to grow into maturity and if you want the blessings of God and you know you do, if you want the hand of God on you and you know you do and you want the favor of God to open doors that no man can open and close those doors that no man can close, then you're going to have to carry the goodness of God and it awakens God to who you are and God starts to bless you where you're at. And he makes this statement if you want to look there with me and it's a powerful one as we look at this principle in Genesis 45 and verse number 15. Go there with me in Genesis 45 verse 15. Moreover, he kissed his brothers and wept over them. After that, his, their brothers were so in shock, it was Joseph. Then they talked to him, but they wouldn't even talk to him. He kisses his brothers and wept over them. All, did he have a right to get even? Yes. Was he now placed in the position to get even? Yes. Wouldn't you think he would take advantage of that, that God put him in that place so that he could, listen, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You have no place with vengeance. You are not the one that causes the trouble. You're not the one that makes it happen. You're not the one that brings chaos and calamity to somebody else's life. You're the one that walks in this extreme ability to do good to those that have against you. And when you do, you open up the heart of God. And when you do, you open up the eyes of God. And when you do, you open up the windows of God. And when you do, you open up the anointing of God. And when you do, you open up the favor of God. And when you do, you catch the heart of God in such a way that God blesses you. Not all about you, but I want to be blessed. Another example was found in Scripture in David. I, I saw it in David's life. David is... Young man, as you know, kills Goliath and he's a superstar in Israel. The king, first king of Israel is a guy named Saul. King Saul is just jealous as he can be of David. And he starts this rampage going crazy trying to kill David. He's trying to kill David for years and years. David runs for his life. Saul can't kill him. Everything in David's life has come to a complete complete stop. He loses everything. He loses his relationships. He loses his position. He loses his wife. He loses his family. He loses his friend. Everything was gone from David's life. 
And David is now at the end of this whole situation, years and years and years, probably over a decade has gone by, running for his life. And you'll find David, he's in this cave and he's hiding with his men, 400 men and they're in the cave. And King Saul is out hunting David, right? And King Saul says to his men, listen, I've got to go to the bathroom. I'm paraphrasing this obviously. He didn't have bathrooms in those days, but you get what I'm saying. He says, I got to go to the bathroom and he goes in this cave. And obviously he takes his robe off, lays it down and goes to the bathroom and David takes his robe and all of his men, he had to stop his men from killing Saul. If now they say, listen, David, Saul was brought to you by God. All we have to do is kill him. We get our farms back. We get our wives, our children back, our families back. We get our land back. All we have to do is kill him. And he's been trying to kill us and God brought your enemy to your footstool. This is the time, David. David, all you need to do is kill him. And David comes against his own men and settles them down and says, we won't touch him. But he goes to Saul and he cuts a piece of his robe off. Saul puts his robe back on, goes outside. As he's walking back the mountain to his men, David comes out of the cave and he starts to yell, Saul! Saul turns around and says, is that you, David? He says, yes. And he says, God brought you to me and I could have killed you, but I didn't, Saul. What's he doing? Operating in a different principal kingdom. What's he doing? He's operating in the spirit of meekness, applying a different kind of a force. If it was me, can I be really honest with you? Saul wouldn't have made it out of the, out of the, out of the cave. His head would have rolled out first. Does anybody know what I'm talking about or am I the only one in here? But I'm learning how to do things differently. God is ministering to all of us while we're in here learning how to do things God's way because God doesn't want us to stay in human force. He wants us to apply a greater force and that's the force of meekness that Deborah was talking about. So he says, yes, and he says, I could have killed you, but I didn't kill you. And the things people say about you, about me to you, they're wrong. And I'm proving it to you. Here's a piece of your robe. That's how close I was to you. And Saul is like blown away. And the most interesting statement is stated by Saul to David. You want to know what he said? Go with me, if you will, into 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, the 24th chapter, in verse number 17. And here's Saul speaking to David. And he says these words. And then he said to David, you are more righteous than I. For you have re rewarded me with good. Let me say it again. I wish I'd underlined that. You have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. In other words, I've been wrong and bad, and you gave me good where I should have gotten bad back. A different principle, a different kingdom principle. It changes your family, it changes your home, it changes your neighborhood, it changes life, it changes this city. If we could just adapt this principle. Simple principle that Jesus has for us. You have rewarded me with good and I have done evil to you, but yet you have done. And he comes along and he makes this in verse 18. I don't have it up there, but you have it in your lap. And it says these words, you're greater than even I am. Powerful verse. One more illustration, kind of an interesting illustration about a prophet in the land of Israel. His name is Elisha. The king of Syria is always planning to make war against Israel. They're the bad guys. Israel is now being told what the plans are of a Syrian king before they ever happen. In other words, they'd say, we're going to attack Israel over there. The prophet would hear from God and tell the king of Israel, don't go over there because the Syrians are going over there. And the Syrians would run over there. There's no Israelites there. And they'd do it over there, they'd run over to get them and there's no Israelites there. Finally, the king gathers all the leadership and says there's somebody 
on the king of Israel's side. In other words, there's a snitch in our group that's telling them all of our moves. And one guy speaks up and he says, no, king of Syria, here's what it is. There's a prophet in the land. He hears from God and tells the king of Israel. And by the time you get there, they're already moved. They're a step ahead of you. He says, well, let's go get this prophet. <laughs> it's kind of a scary thing if you were a prophet. Here's this whole army chasing you down. And so they come to chase after them, and you'll find that the prophet is now confronted with these band of Syrians that came after him to kill him and bring him back to the king of Syria. It's interesting because what takes place is you, an interesting story. God is approached by the prophet. The prophet says, blind these men so they can't see. So these men come after the prophet. They can't see a thing. And the prophet speaks to them and says, I'm going to take you back to Syria, Syria myself. But he doesn't. He opens up and takes them and leads them into the Israel, uh, land of Israel. And they find themselves, he says, okay, God, open their eyes. And they open their eyes and they find themselves in captivity to, the, to Israel. And they take this band of Syrians to the, if you will, that were out to kill the prophet and stop the Israeli army. They were literally going to do something. They were going to take him and kill them. And, and, and the king makes a statement. I want to show it to you. It's really fascinating. The king makes this statement in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, verse number 22. In fact, I'll read verse 21, if you will. 2 Kings, the 6th chapter. If you've got your Bible, go there. And let's start at verse 21. I don't think I have 21 on the overhead. I should have probably put it there, but I, but I think I didn't put that there. And the king of Israel saw them, all of this band of these bad guys that have come after Elisha. And he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? In other words, the natural thing to do is this is the enemy. Let's kill them. But I'm not going to do it until you tell me to, Elisha. Should I kill them? Elisha makes the most interesting statement in verse number 22. He says, but he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Now this doesn't even make sense, my friends. This is crazy. This is the enemy. They've come to kill all of us. Kill Elijah, uh, Elisha. They've come to kill everybody. They want to stop the armies of Israel. Of course you kill them. But here you see the prophet says, no, feed them and give them lots to drink and then send them back to their master. So they feed them and they just get full and they drink a lot and they send them back to their master. Man, these guys are like thinking I'm going to get at any moment on my way out. They're going to shoot me in the back or something. They finally get back to Syria and they report to the king. Do you know what happened from that point on? The king never raided Israel again because of what took place. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. The very thing that you don't think can happen because you operate in a different kingdom principle is backed by God to happen. Let me say it again. The very thing that you don't think can happen is backed by God to happen when you operate in a kingdom principle like this. It's not easy. Got to get past your flesh. But loving those that hate you and despise you. Well, you say, well, pastor, all of that's good. I see so many examples of it. It's probably true. But if you're like me, you're asking this question right now. How do I do that? Because I don't know how to do that. I'll show you one verse in the scripture. 
and you'll find it to be a fabulous verse. May I take you there? This one wonderful verse found in Matthew. Once again, I want to share it with you in the fifth chapter. Matthew, if you've got your Bibles, the fifth chapter, right there at the end, verse 44. Jesus himself is speaking, who's a perfect example for all of us, isn't he? And he makes this statement about this same exact principle of the kingdom of God, operating by meekness instead of operating by physical force. Meekness being flexible to the ways of God. Wow. Verse 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I looked at it and I said, Lord, I hate this verse. <laughs> because it's so not me. Is any, can anybody else admit that besides me? It's just so not me. I mean, I, I, I have people that have done wrong in my life. And yes, I forgive them, but there isn't any way I'm going to love them. There isn't any way I'm going to bless them. In fact, to be honest with you, Lord, I don't even want them blessed. <laughs> and here's the difference. Is this about my want or your want? Or is it about his want? Because if we're really his, now let me say that again to you. Because if we're really his, it's really about his want and not my want. My want is a natural want. Get him. God. I'll pray for you. God, get him. Drop him, God. You know it. You're the same way. But that's the natural response. I need a supernatural response that brings in a supernatural result. Think about it like this. Jesus on the cross could call ten thousands of ten thousands of angels to rescue him. And he says, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. Over and over again, you find it in Scripture. You find it in scripture. Four things he says. Lord, he says, I want you to love your enemy. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to show you how. Then he says, I want you to bless those. Lord, I want to bless them. They hurt me and I want them to hurt. Then he says, I want you to do good to those who hate you. And then he says, I want you to pray. And I said to God today, as I was meditating this verse, God supernaturally took me to this verse, and I heard his voice for you and I. And he says, this is the only verse you need to have in order to live in the kingdom principle of meekness. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you can't do love, you can't do bless, and you can't do unless you pray. In other words, it's just backwards there. God wants me to love, but I don't know how to love. God wants me to bless, but I don't feel like blessing. God wants me to do good, but I don't know how to do good. See, I might be able to love, but I'm not going to bless. Or I might be able to bless, but I'm not going to do. But in order for me to do all of them, I found out the key to something is if I pray for them. When I start to pray for somebody, all of a sudden, can I just tell you the truth? 
I get connected spiritually with God about that person. And God will show me things about the person, why they're that way, what happens in their past, what made them that way, how come they're insecure, how come they're kind, unkind, how come they're this way, how come they're that way. God knows it all and he shows it to me. He doesn't show it to me until I care enough to pray. And then after I have prayed, may I say this to you, I start to love and when I start to love, then I can bless and when I start to bless, then I can do. But it all starts with one thing. It's called praying. Of course, before that, you're going to have to walk in forgiveness. Simply. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you understand and know that you gotta, can't hold a grudge. You, got, you don't have a spirit of retaliation on you. But you get over that and forgive them. I, I've always been the kind of person, I forgive them, but I don't want anything to do with them. You might know what I'm talking about? Oh, yes, have you forgiven them? Yes, but I still hurt. <clears throat> I, God said for me to forgive, but he didn't call me stupid and hang around them again. And, I, and that may be the truth. I don't have to hang around them, and I don't have to do what I did before, and I don't have to be there. Come on, I'm not saying you have to, but I do say you do this. Listen to this. When there's an enemy, if you pray, you'll start to love, you'll start to bless, and you'll start to do So tonight, when we're in this place of learning how the kingdom works, you got to know that you're not alone. That's a good feeling. That most likely all of us have these feelings. There might be one or two of you that are super spiritual and you have no problems in loving the enemy and blessing the enemy and doing good to the enemy and let me know who you are and we'll make you the pastor of the church. <laughs> but this pastor is being real with you. And all of us are in this together. We're learning how to do the kingdom life because when you do it, all of a sudden the Saul's in your life get off your back. You never attack David again. All of a sudden, the enemies, listen to this, of Israel never attacked Israel again. All because they took a different stand in a different way. You'll find that all of a sudden, David's, uh, excuse me, Joseph's family was opened up to him. And they were prosperous and successful. All because it changed around to what you really wanted and what you really felt you wanted, all because you implemented a different kingdom principle. And Jesus said you turn the cheek and bless and love and do and watch God turn it around. I have this one relative that I have to be honest with you has been an irritant to me all my life. Anybody got relatives? Thank you for being honest, all five of you. <laughs> Makes me feel good to know I'm only one of five. <laughs> and about uh, six months ago, I just started praying for them. I, I, I don't even like them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't tell me there's people you all, you like everybody. You don't. Neither did I. I don't like them. Didn't even want to pray for them. Need to go to hell. <laughs> the sooner the better. <laughs> this is your pastor. Boy, are you in trouble. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I started falling in love. All of a sudden, I started blessing. All of a sudden, listen to these words, a relationship started to build again. And all of the stuff that was so hurtful from the past fell off, and I don't even remember it. And now I can do good. I even drove to where they were a couple of months ago and had lunch with them, and I bought. <laughs> And can I say this to you? Totally enjoyed them. They weren't wrong. I was wrong. Because I hadn't implemented 
that which was supernatural. I was living in the natural. I wanted supernatural results, but I was implementing a natural feeling instead of the supernatural activity that brings me the supernatural results. Guys, it's not easy, but we're all in this together. So, pray, love, bless, and do. Start with prayer. The rest will fall in line. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Just love you guys. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Here's the deal. Maybe you came tonight and you're not sure where you're at with God. You know, a lot of people think they're okay with God when they're not. There's no way in the world you're going to heaven because you're a positive thinker. Can you imagine saying, well, I'm okay with God, I'm okay with God, I'm okay with God. And God's going to let you in heaven because you are a positive thinker. It doesn't work that way. Some people think they're going to heaven, you know, because they're really nice or good. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. You need to understand that there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven any other way. You can't get there my way or your way or some well meaning church committees where you're only going to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly how to get there. In John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. A lot of people don't even know what born again means, so let me explain it to you. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. Did you hear me? All or nothing. That means you're going to have to give God. And you notice how I emphasize the word give? You've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. He's not a thief to rob your heart from you or a conniver to talk your life out of you. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. He could make you do it if you, if you wanted to. But he gave you a free will choice to give God all of your heart give God all of your life. Now look, let's be honest with each other. You don't get to heaven because you're smart or pretty or American. You don't get to heaven because you've got a college degree or you're cool. You've got talents and gifts. You get to heaven because you're born again. That means you've got to give God what you have. All of your heart, that's what he's looking for, all of your life. That's what he gave you. And tonight, it's your night of salvation. You're not here by mistake. This is a divine appointment that you have with God. God brought you here for a reason. To give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. I can't make you do this. Nobody can. It's got to be you that do it yourself. Because you choose, made the choice, to go for God with all of your heart and all of your life. So here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed. We've been up front. We've been honest up in front with you. Said it like it is. You saw it for yourself. You read it for yourself. Tonight, in this place, some of you need to be honest with yourself. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Or do you just know him in your head? You know, you celebrate Easter, you celebrate Christmas, you know who Jesus is, and you think that's going to get you to heaven and makes you a Christian? No way, Jose, it's not going to work. Because it's not about what you have in your head. Even the devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. So the fact that you know who he is and celebrate Christmas and Easter does not make you a Christian. Or the fact that you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to be born again. And the way to do that is to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. So we're in this safe, friendly place. Tonight is your night of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before me, and I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. Let's do it his way, okay? In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And then I'm going to pound my Bible. I'm going to go, bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want just Jesus in my head. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and deny my presence in hell. I don't want to go to hell. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down, and then we're going to pray with you. And it's so simple, so easy. You say, Pastor, if I have to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. The people I came with will see me. 
People behind me will see me. I, I, people next to me will see me. I'll feel funny. No, nope, don't feel funny. But if you did, it's better to feel funny for a moment and be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you think more of the people that are watching you instead of who God is. Come on, tonight, it's your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Here's who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you really know you haven't really given him all of your life, you kind of do your own thing and hope he's following you instead of you following him, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure if you've ever really given it to him, make sure tonight, tonight's your night. Just put your hand up in a moment as soon as you hear me pound my Bible and then put it right back down let me see it. Is that okay? All across this auditorium, I've done my job now. It's your job to do your heart. I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's three wise people in here. Anybody else? There's four. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one back there. Five in the family room. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's five wise people. Don't miss this opportunity. There's another one here. Six. Is that right? Six right back there. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's six wise people. Anybody? 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 You're going to miss this? Anybody? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for six wise people. All six of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. In a moment, we'll all stand, sing a song. I want you to get out of your seat. Wait a minute. If you're serious about God, you're serious about this. If he can walk a beaten, bloody path to, to, Cal Cal uh, to Calvary Hill for you, you can walk a safe aisle for him. So let me just say that again. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. If you're serious about God, no, wait a minute. There's six of you that raised your hand, but I know there's another six that needed to raise their hand. You can come too. So check with your neighbor. Say, come on, neighbor, I'll go with you. Get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. No one leaves during this period of time. Come on, stand your feet, and let's just give them a clap offering as they come. You come right now. Come, 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 come. Coming, come on out of the family Your room. It's okay. Come. He says to men and to he, take a look down inside. Come on, you come too. Come on, come on. See what you see. You know that I love you from the deepest part of me. You're all my life. You're all I need. Come on, you come, come. So take Well, thank God you guys have come. This is so cool. This is a good thing, so put a smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Right here is a friend of ours. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a good guy. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. Let me tell you something. This is a great beginning to a great future. Listen to what he has to say. Only takes a few moments. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? So just make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, 
as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.